that's not the neighborhood, but you guys can think whatever you want. That's not the neighborhood, but you guys can think whatever you want. The last official installment on this generation of consoles, we made it. Not because I'm ignoring 2K21 or anything that might come after, but because those won't be considered the official installments as time passes. Pretty much the same way we disregard 2K14 for the PS3 in favor of the graphical masterpiece that dropped a couple of months later. So this is the end of our journey, but does it go out on a high note? That's what we'll figure out as for the final time, we rank the 2Ks based off their presentation, gameplay, graphics, and features. I don't know exactly how to feel about this. On one hand, do what works. And 2K19's presentation absolutely worked. On the other, this is pretty much 19's exact menu setup with a different coat of paint. And a quick look back would show you in this series that this was the first time 2K just outright reused an interface. However, I much prefer these to the lifeless menus of 17 and 21, so I'm not necessarily complaining here, it's just the lack of creativity. The navigation was based on the exact same idea, select an option, and transport to an area in the background. I will say I do enjoy the team murals more here though, as opposed to a plain cutout, the best player on the team was the focus of a creative design. The graphics for the pregame show were also absolutely gorgeous. They are fairly difficult to do wrong, but they improved on the messy player graphics in the previous year opting for a more 3D neon type setting, and we almost always skip these, so it is interesting to see the amount of detail that went into it. I literally just got done playing this game, so everything is fresh. Let's start with the fact that the challenge system was flat out broken. It really may have well have just been a coin toss. The amount of times I challenged a call that I knew was wrong and got away with it suggested it was more probability than anything. Yet that was not even the worst part. Upon winning a challenge, you could not see the jump ball. So during streams, we basically had to guess when the ball was being tossed based off the coach's eye and head movements because that's all the camera showed. It feels like this could have been patched, but spoiler, it was not. Impalement more formally known as clipping. Now, I'm well aware this is just something that happens in video games, and that it's definitely happened in 2K before, but there is no doubt this was the first iteration of 2K where it felt like an actual gameplay feature and not just a bug. Fouls were often called this way, players' hands would go through the ball without affecting the shot, and it made the gameplay feel far less convincing. In older 2Ks, this felt like an every now and then issue. In 2K20, the frequency made it a running joke during our streams. The computer sucked. This would likely only matter if you were playing My League anyway, but it's gameplay nonetheless. The Hall of Fame computer that this game came loaded with did absolutely nothing to make the game interesting. You could often pull away by halftime with any sort of real effort. The mad search for competition they created led me to Beyond Hall of Fame sliders, which led to the most frustrating balancing act of getting a decent game versus every player gaining the attributes of Michael Jordan. Basically, either you would use the game's default sliders and you could score too easily, or you use some custom sliders and went through the gruesome process of toning them to a point where you could score at all. This has always felt frustrating with 2K because it really feels like the last time a computer was just perfectly balanced was NBA 2K16. There was a very noticeable drop off in the AI for 17 and it feels like it just never quite got back to that level where you could just play the game and not worry about having to find something custom. Speaking of things being out of balance, outlet passes were also ridiculously impossible, which seems to be something that flips back and forth each year. 2K21 has once again overcorrected and you can now outlet perfectly without even looking. We call that the rec center. However, credit for the things they did fix, I guess. The cheesy self lobs, illegal screens, basically the blatantly broken mechanics that felt patchable in the first place. But aside from those fixes, even most of the gameplay changes 2K claims they made felt a bit ambiguous. They touted their new motion engine which involved changes in planting, new dribble styles, and read and react defense which was meant to allow users to see which way the ball handler was dribbling in an effort to make defense easier to play. That and dribbling were probably the most noticeable. Anytime they throw in motion and planting and whatnot, those things might make the game feel a little bit different, but it feels like those changes end up getting lost throughout the year. Badges saw a bit more tuning though, and specific badges for the neighborhood were added given how much different the gameplay there normally is. And speaking of the neighborhood. So let's just address the elephant in the room before anything else. First off, this was not the first time 2K cut corners on changes to the park. One could argue, like presentation, you just do what works. So when 17 wound up using 16's park, was it really the worst idea? People generally like those. However, I'm not sure love for the neighborhood ever got quite as strong. And given that the entire concept of this mode had so much potential and park had only grown in popularity, the appetite for improvements was a fair deal higher. So when the community asked Ronnie about which changes were on the horizon, well, 
the infamous moment. Now, as fun as this moment is to revisit and laugh at, I've always had a hard time believing that he just blatantly lied to the community. It felt more likely that somebody on the team told him about concepts that may have been being worked on, and he took them as fact. However, I've also been told about concepts and progress that may or may not show up in a final game, yet I've never found it wise to report it as fact. See, the thing about reporting on speculation is ideally you would disclose that you're reporting on speculation. Being a spokesperson for the company and reporting that A, you'd be able to respec your builds, which was a huge deal, and that B, the neighborhood would be different, when that ends up not being the case, that appears to be borderline false advertisement. But the neighborhood did change, I guess. It saw some decorations for the holidays, the time of day now changed. Um, yeah. Other than that, pretty close to identical. I've also suspected that it came out that way due to the fact that next gen was merely one year away at the time, so focusing on an entirely new concept would have been difficult and slightly nonsensical. However, just when I think that, 2K21 drops and they launched the 2K Beach, which is just a reskin neighborhood. So especially knowing that this was the end of the console generation, it felt like they could have just done the beach last year then copied it over for 2K21. At least then it would have been under the excuse that a new game was coming two months later. Well, at least the My Player Builder switched up. Now, instead of selecting an archetype to start from, you technically built your own from the ground up. The new pie chart system allowed you to start your play with features most important to your playstyle. You could then go in and set your potential, and even test it out to see if the max version of your build would play how you imagined. You just couldn't respect the build once you spent your points on said potential. For probably the first time ever, I actually did somewhat enjoy the story. They reduced the cringe by roughly 90% since the Be Fresh incident, and wrote something somewhat believable and engaging. I'd venture to say this was the best and most realistic story of this generation. My team saw some significant additions, which obviously doesn't speak for the quality. Take for instance, position locks. When this news dropped, my team players, including myself, hit the ceiling with joy. My team cards were now going to come with certain positions etched onto them, meaning obviously they could only be used at that position. On paper, this meant that those cheesy lineups people were spamming timeouts to use all game would no longer be permitted. In reality, it was just to open yet another opportunity for profit all along. Glitch cards were introduced which literally just locked those cheese lineups behind more playtime and or more money. Take for instance the Giannis glitch card that could play power forward but also point guard. That was already one of the most common uses for him in 2k19. The difference now was, you just had to earn the privilege to do that after opening packs. That is probably the most 2k thing we will ever see. So not only were position locks anything but a genuine attempt to balance gameplay within the mode, it further threw it into chaos. There were certain cards, say a star shooting guard maybe, and he couldn't be used as a small forward even though those could easily be interchangeable. That offered far too much limiting in the combination of lineups, and in short, made position locks a useless and largely frustrating feature. Evolution cards however were a lot of fun, providing yet another reason to spend hours in the mode. These were cards that you would upgrade through various challenges, and put back on the market to help other people with their challenges. Challenges such as the spotlight collections, which basically took a legendary player, and had you collect other players that were important to keep moments throughout his career. The problem with this quickly became acquiring certain cards so that you could even participate in certain games within these challenges. These players were either very hard to pull, or they cost an arm and a leg in the auction. Needless to say, getting these players organically became extremely time consuming, and I'm not sure anybody with a regular life had time for this. Spotlight was just one series added however, with Prime Series cards and Legacy Showcase cards also making their debut. Triple Threat was yet again an entertaining mode, but this year after each win, you get to participate in a ball drop to collect prizes, which would simultaneously turn your PlayStation 4 into a Boeing 737. If you know, you know. Daily login prizes were added with the goal of getting you to play the mode every day leading up to a bigger prize, limited time events allowed you to chase prizes for a limited time that day, and overall they did a decent job making everybody forget about that disaster of a trailer that made the mode look like a full on gambling ploy, which it still kind of was. That's just my team. All in all, my team as usual saw a million tiny additions, and the mode came with plenty of activities whether that be offline or against real opponents. I personally ran into the same issue as 2k19 though, where running over the garbage computer for hours until finally getting a challenge kind of became a drag, especially when the challenge that finally came felt impossible. For example, grabbing some number of rebounds with some scrub player while also trying to win the game, just to inevitably not even end up with the card I needed to continue the challenge. Again, if you could invest a certain amount of time, then I guess. 
The focus in the franchise features this time around appeared to be my GM, as it was now dubbed my GM 2.0, and a specific feature got people rather excited. It was announced that the mode would now be somewhat connected rather than an individual experience. This was accomplished through leaderboards that were added to depict where players stood as opposed to other players leading their respective franchises, and players were organized by their score. There were more decisions to make, and a new skill tree allowed you to build your own style of managing. Other than that, they built on a lot of the concepts that were already there like relationships, and their specific goal was to make the mode more accessible to players who were using it for the first time. On the other side, in my league, personality badges were added to, in theory, help players make more realistic decisions in the offseason. Through a 28 year simulation, there really were only a handful of moves that made absolutely no sense for star players, so I can't say that this didn't help. The other big addition? Being able to force winners in games. If you're into simming seasons and whatnot, this is absolutely a useful tool that needs to remain forever. It's a great way to self-correct when and if the computer screws up. Surprise, surprise, Play Now Online remained an L. It was copied straight from 19 and pasted right into 20 despite all of its shortcomings. Actually, it was an even bigger L. Maybe the game wouldn't disconnect you anymore, but on PlayStation, the gameplay was extremely choppy for no apparent reason, rendering the mode unplayable for much of the year. Once again, not the internet. I played the same exact game on Xbox, and I had no issues despite the occasional disconnect over time. It remains a mystery why the mode with the least features is the toughest to use or enjoy. Before finally moving on to rankings, you may be thinking that I forgot about the graphics, and well, that's because I did. I'm organically adding them here where they cross my mind, which says something, but not everything. NBA 2K20 was not ugly by any stretch of imagination. The bodies weren't all stringy looking like 2K17, they never went that low again. But the best way I can describe the change from 19 to 20 would be maybe a color change and some wrinkles on the players. In essence, you'd have to look really really hard and close to see any significant difference in the graphics themselves, which I guess makes sense with it being the last standalone 2K for this console. They did however finally hire PC modders to work on cyber faces, and that's how you wound up with guys like Tracy McGrady actually looking somewhat like themselves. That was a noticeable improvement that took far too long to implement. Better late than never though. Some of these cyber faces for next gen are coming out gorgeous. Given presentation a 10 the year before, it's gotta be a 9 here, taking a point away for the lack of creativity. Sure, the interface was amazing in 19 and it's amazing here, but repainting it was indicative of the lack of detail in certain aspects as we discussed with the neighborhood. Still loved it, but presenting something different in this department from year to year remains important, especially because you can tell when they don't care. In NBA 2K21, they simply don't care. If gameplay for a 19 was a 6.7, a 6.9 feels fair here. I'm not giving away too many kudos for fixing problems that shouldn't have existed in the first place, and shouldn't have honestly been that difficult to do away with earlier. That on top of the other issues that prevailed, and our regular 2K grievances, by the time June rolled around, I could not wait to stop playing this game. Graphics remain a 9 here, as they did not go backwards from 19, but they really didn't push the envelope or go that far forward either. The biggest difference was they did some much needed work to important cyber faces, but that also feels like something that does not deserve that many kudos because there's no way they looked at this Tracy McGrady in NBA 2K16 and every year after that thought it was acceptable. There's many players like this. There's still players like this. On features, it's gonna be a deadly 5 this time. Play Now was a steaming pile of garbage. Copy and pasted garbage at that. And oh yeah, Blacktop was also copy and pasted garbage if you were still wondering. I know I stopped mentioning Blacktop ages ago, but that's because it's just no longer worth mentioning by this point. My GM got all the additions, leaving my league to see only minor changes, but what really drags everything down here is the neighborhood. With the expectations this mode set in 18, to more or less copy and paste it into two straight games while having it circulate that it was seeing some sort of change? That was just downright disrespectful. There should be no pass provided here just because next gen was already in the works. At a minimum, they could have done a 2K Beach style reskin to at least pretend there was something different. Oh, and while we're on the topic of pretending, in my team, they definitely pretended position locks were this thoughtful inclusion to help the quality of life in the mode, only for it to basically be a scam for something we already had. Adding things doesn't just run up the score here, and the features rightfully suffer this time as they more or less copy and pasted some very important parts of these modes. Put all these together, NBA 2K20 lands at a 7.4 which deservingly ranks it in the bottom 4. Well, it's been a journey. I began ranking 2Ks back in the summer of 2018, starting with NBA 2K7. This was the release where I believe they began to noticeably surpass NBA Live in both quality of game and fan interest. Two years later, we stop here, perfectly at NBA 2K20 and at the end of this console generation as we await the real release of 2K21 in around a week. The final stop will be to look at the rankings we've come up with and use those scores to help build an official list that ranks these games since they have asserted their dominance over the market. I just make that point because 
not many people played NBA 2K to NBA 2K6, so this is what we have. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button, comment, and subscribe, and also hit a bell next to my name if you want notifications every time a new video drops. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.